Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, boxing fans around the world. We got some exciting stuff happening. We're now in March. Finally, we got past the the drought that was February. Now we're in March where we're going to be seeing some really exciting fights on deck for March and April. Of course, you can check us out on YouTube. If you're listening to this, you're already here. CryptoTalkRadio.net is our site in case you want to check out our other podcasts that we have in the series. But let's go ahead and get into the stuff I believe is worth your time in the world of boxing. There's been chatter fresh off Kell Brook getting the stoppage against Amir Khan, finally resolving that itch on his back, and then people are calling him out. Ironically, Connor Ben, the son of Nigel Ben, and Chris Eubank Jr., a.k.a. Next Gen, the son of Chris Eubank Sr., formerly known as Simply the Best or formerly known as English, depending on when you asked him. Both of these guys have called him out, and I know what you're thinking. Connor Ben predominantly has been campaigning at 154, but he's also to- he's toyed at 147 because he's able to basically outweigh his opponent. And some were like, no, he's a welterweight. We got to remember that Jeff Horn, you know, Zarafa, Tim Zhu, all these guys predominantly have fought at 154. Connor Ben has fought some of these guys at 154. The 147 did come into play. But it's because Connor Ben is able to weight weight bully everybody there. That's why he's doing it. Let's be honest, Connor Ben is he's essentially a junior middleweight, but he's able to drain himself down to 147. Now, how long it's gonna last, we don't know. So this 154 came into play because Kell Brook has struggled to make 147. He says he can make 154 pretty easy. And so there was chatter with Connor Ben saying, Oh, I can do 154 easy. Of course he can. And let's fight Kell Brook. And Kell Brook says, well, we can possibly do that. No problem. But then Chris Eubank Jr., who has mostly campaigned above the 160 mark, came out and said, of course, I can make that weight. We can do a catch weight. And then, of course, it's it's signature because you have the sons of the two guys who have been at each other's throats for years in English history. And then now the two sons are apparently able to make the same weight of 154. So you ask yourself, how come the two sons couldn't fight? The reason I bring that up is ironic. As a while ago, there was a chatter about, I believe it was Connor Ben who called out Eubank Jr. And Eubank Jr. said, I'm not able to make that weight. When he comes up, we can have that fight. Okay, well, now you're both 154. Why can't two of you fight each other and let Kell Brook? I think Kell Brook should take a soft touch, frankly. I don't think he should fight anybody who's young at this point. If you heard me, after that fight, I said Kell Brook's got maybe two more fights left in him and they should retire. He seems to think he can go on a longer run. I don't agree. I think he'll get seriously hurt because, remember, both his eye sockets are jacked up. So if it were me and I were managing all these guys, I would say Kell Brook needs to take a soft touch. Like, I would like to see Kell Brook maybe in there against a Zarafa type guy, somebody that's not somebody that's not upper level but still is somewhat of a challenge to come off the con, kind of get back into the groove of regular fights where he's not getting his eyes shattered. I just think he needs that. He needs to get back in that, and I don't want to see him against dangerous fighters, certainly, and I would qualify Conor Ben as a dangerous fighter. I don't think that Eubank Jr. is as dangerous from a skill perspective. I think he's dangerous from a size perspective. I think Eubank Jr. would be way too strong for Kell Brook, and he would get seriously hurt. It's not skill. I think... You, that fight goes the same way as George Groves. I think Kell Brook easily outboxes Eubank Jr. Even with Eubank Jr. fancying himself for a Jones, I think he'll get frustrated, he'll abandon the game plan, and he'll play right into Kell Brook's strengths, which is counterattacks. So I don't want to see that fight because I think size would be the differentiator. Connor Ben, I think, would be too dangerous for Kell Brook at this point, even though they're equivalent size. I just think he's too aggressive, too fast, and he would seriously hurt Kell Brook just from a equal size perspective. But if you do a step down type fight, someone a little bit lesser like a Zarafa, perhaps I think that one's okay. Um, Lara's moved up, so he's not there. Maybe a Jamel Charlo. A Jamel Charlo fight might be interesting, but everybody else is calling on Jamel too, so it's unlikely to happen. I just I don't want to see Kell Brook in there against the top guys. Errol Spence. He seems to be back in full form. He's tried to convince people that he's back in full form and that they're not going to see anything other than a great showing when he fights Jordanius Ugas on April 16th. That's going to be on a Showtime pay-per-view, by the way. He did some interviews, and, of course, the question inevitably came up because Spence has his saying, which is called strap season. 
and he has shirts and the shirts say strap season and strap season, of course, you know, means that he's seeking out titles and he's been hindered from doing that from his injuries. It's held him back, but he says he's back on track. He inevitably got asked the question again about fighting Terrence Crawford as he always does because Terrence Crawford has the WBO title to which he said, we'll see. Like I said, I got to get past Uga first. So once I get past him, we'll definitely see. And then it was, but like I said, you read the shirt, right? You know, to the strap season. So he seems to think that he's confident he can get it done. And people still don't accept, which is weird, but they still don't accept that Spence is the A side of the welterweight division as he is. And so they keep questioning him because they there's still this narrative that Crawford is somehow number one, whatever, despite the fact that he's not beaten anybody of high quality other than Porter. And we found out that Porter had bum hips and then his dad stopped him, not Crawford. So we still have shot. Spence has more signature wins. He has two titles. It's clear he's the top guy at welterweight. However, the media is still hyping Crawford because it's Crawford. And despite Crawford not having proven anything to which Spence reply, well, I've been shot collars now that would matter. I've been shot collar, you know, like I said, I'm the big fish, especially 147, so that don't matter at all. So he's trying to clarify to people. He's like, look, man, I'm the guy, and he is the guy. We know he's the guy. People are kind of in denial. The version of Brooke that Spence stopped was a significantly more powerful, more solid, more dangerous opponent than the version Crawford smoked. And even then, Brooke still took four rounds off Crawford even on decline. But the version that Spence fought was better than the version that Crawford fought. Same with Porter. So we can't we can't equate the wins. We cannot. Spence has the better wins at the better time. Spence has two belts. Spence has beat Danny Swift and pretty much was a blowout. So we can't do it. Spence is the number one. And I want to see him fight Terrence Crawford, but I do want to see Crawford fight somebody else in the meantime and stop squawking about a Keith Thurman fight that he hasn't yet earned in the vast majority of PBC's eyes, I think Crawford and Thurman should tie up. Thurman needs a fight. He's had his get back. The get back went reasonably well. I wasn't overly impressed, but he did manage to get through it. Now let's go ahead and do Crawford against Thurman. I think that's a fight worth watching because if Thurman is able to expose Crawford, which I don't know that he can, but if he is, we can stop this chatter about Crawford, relegate him down the list, solve this question about Spence and Ugas, whoever's the top guy. I saw Ugas at the at the faceoff. Ugas looks dangerous to me. Ugas looks like he's going to give Spence everything he can handle. I know people are saying they're underrating Jordanius Ugas. He's a solid fighter, and the way he looks, he's game. Every single time I see this dude, he's hungry. You can see it in his eyes. And though he's slightly older, he doesn't seem to have lost a step. Apparently, he had a bicep injury despite an amazing boxing masterclass against Manny Pacquiao. So I think Ugas is going to come to fight. And if Ugas can pull it off, and I'm not saying he can or can't, but I'm saying if he can, that would be a very compelling fight, would be Ugas and Crawford. Remember, Ugas beat Crawford in the amps. So now the game would change. If Ugas is able to topple Errol Spence, the game would change because now you got Keith Thurman, who even Bomax said would be a threat to Crawford. you got Jordanius Ugas, who's beat Crawford in the amps, and I think he's a threat. You just got all sorts of smoke. The smoke changes. Like, I think Spence easily washes Terrence Crawford. I believe this firmly in my heart of hearts. However, I understand that the injury, the car accident, and everything else that Spence has been through holds him back a little bit. And I wouldn't want there being any asterisks. Crawford already has an asterisk against every win at 147. Unfortunately, because we learned later, Porter had bum hips when he fought Terrence Crawford. That We don't know how that played into what Porter was doing, banging the matter after the fact. We don't know any of this. And there were alternate views of the fight where somebody was trying to hold back Kenny Porter so it wasn't a joint decision of the corner that he, they stopped that fight. We don't know what would happen if it kept on going. There's so many, that's an asterisk. So Crawford doesn't have a single win at 147 that doesn't have some kind of asterisk, and that's sad. Now, with Spence and what's happened to him, it's another asterisk even if they do fight. I would really like to see Keith Thurman or Yodenis Ugas. Even though Keith Thurman had the injuries in the past, he seemed to look really good against Barrios. I just I felt like he should be able to stop him, and I'm not sure why he couldn't, but it's a get-back fight, so I'm going to give him the benefit of the doubt. I would love to see that fight. I would love to see Crawford against Ugas because those, I think, would be really good tests for where Crawford's at. Stylistically, we suspect Crawford takes out Ugas easy, but again, Ugas beat Crawford in the AMs, so it's a different game. 
We'll have to see, Spence Ugas. It's going to be worth watching. If you're one of those that's going to duck that fight, you're going to miss a good one. I think that one's going to tell us a lot about where Earl Spence is as a fighter. So we got to just watch that. Devin Alexander, who I like to call Blinky, and I believe it was the Bradley fight, I perhaps. There was a fight where Devin Alexander, he had started blinking because I believe it was headbutt related, and then he quit, and I, I've called him Blinky ever since. Now, this is a guy, he used to be at the top of the game. He used to be one of the signature fighters, a name, solid. And then he's went on decline. It seemed like he just didn't want to fight anywhere near as solid as he used to. Same with Lamont Peterson. Devin Alexander has recently come out saying he would really like to fight Robert Guerrero. And you're like, why? Robert Guerrero, ironically, when he came back, he's been on a win streak of sorts. And so he's now kind of revitalized his career and he seems to be back in the game. I wouldn't put it as a main event because I don't think either guy is a draw to that degree. I think Robert Guerrero is still a draw of some note, but nowhere near where he was uh, in his prime. And people often criticize Floyd Mayweather for fighting Robert Guerrero. But at the time, Guerrero was at the top. He was one of the highly regarded fighters when Floyd fought him. And then Floyd just straight up embarrassed the dude. And then history changed, you know, people change history and they go back and they're like, well, but it's Robert Guerrero. Robert Guerrero was at the top of the game when he fought him. And there's also a story behind why Floyd fought him. If you notice the pattern, see way back before Andre Berto fought Virgil or, or Victor Ortiz the first time. So we're talking ages ago. Before that fight, 2011, Floyd had always wanted to fight Andre Berto. Nobody knew why, but he just always wanted to fight Andre Berto. He goes in there against Victor Ortiz. It's a fight of the year candidate, and he loses to Victor Ortiz in the first fight. That's 2011. From that loss, Andre Berto was never the same. He was never the same. He had, he had some wins, but he was never the same fighter as he was prior to that when he was fighting guys like Steve Forbes, for example. He just would, he was not consistent. So then when Floyd eventually fights Andre Berto, it's after the fact. So it's after Robert Guerrero had beaten Andre Berto. Then Floyd fights Berto in 2015 as his closeout fight as a pro, officially. But he chose to fight Robert Guerrero as the guy who beat Andre Berto. So people criticize the fact that he fought Guerrero, did Floyd. But remember, Guerrero got the interim WBC for beating Andre Berto, which positioned Floyd from a title perspective to help unify the division somewhat when he eventually fought Manny Pacquiao. So it's convenient to try to go back and rewrite history. But the truth is that Floyd going in there and fighting Robert Guerrero after Robert Guerrero had beaten Andre Berto was strategic because Floyd always wanted to fight Andre Berto. It's the same story of Victor Ortiz. Floyd fights the guys that beat the guy that he wanted to fight. He doesn't fight who the eye test guys want him to fight. He never did. So he got criticism for fighting Mosley when he did. But remember, Mosley was fresh off dominating Marga Cheeto and Floyd had been calling out Mosley for years and Mosley ducking for years. When Mosley finally came around because Money Mayweather's now the top guy, now it's rewriting history. Well, Mosley was old. Da, 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 da. No, Mosley ducked him for those years. Mosley took out your eye test in Margachito. There was no reason to fight Margachito. Victor Ortiz beats Andre Berto, which was unexpected at the time. Floyd had wanted to fight Andre Berto, but now it's not going to look good if he fights the guy who just lost to Victor Ortiz versus fighting Victor Ortiz. He fights Victor Ortiz. He beats Victor Ortiz with veritable ease. I could go on and on. If you look at who Floyd fought and when he fought them, he fought guys that were fresh off beating the guys that everybody was hyping him to fight after that he went and done that. So again, look at Cotto. Cotto was fresh off stopping Margachito. Uh, in the rematch, Floyd goes and fights Cotto because, again, Cotto's the one that took out Margachito and then Mosley had taken out Margachito. So Floyd's over here taking out the guys that, like you see what I'm saying? So I looked at it as it's all around Berto at the end of the day. Berto, Floyd wanted to fight him. Berto takes that loss to Ortiz. Floyd takes out Ortiz. Berto takes the loss to Guerrero. Floyd takes out Guerrero. And then eventually he fights Andre Berto. Now, with Andre Berto, when this all comes around that now he's fighting Floyd Mayweather and then Floyd Mayweather is going to fight Robert Guerrero, Robert Guerrero was considered by the, let's say, the non-mainstream, you know, the NSBs and the, the, the world, 
Robert, Robert Guerrero was not highly regarded by the, let's say, the online pundits, I guess is the best. Robert Guerrero was a title holder. Robert Guerrero is a multi-time title holder. Robert Guerrero had beaten some solid guys, including Casimir. So Robert Guerrero was up there, and I think he got a bum rap just because he was in there against Floyd. Floyd got the lineal crown, essentially, for beating Robert Guerrero. He didn't get the official one, but he essentially was considered the guy for beating Robert Guerrero because of who Robert Guerrero beat. So now Robert Guerrero has been, he came back and he's been on a four fight win streak in 2018. He gets a knockout win in 2019. He gets a stoppage win and another win against Thomas. And then the most recent one was against Victor Ortiz, which they had never fought in their prime. Robert Guerrero and Victor Ortiz. That was a very good fight, a war back and forth. And the two of them, this is on the uh, Pacquiao Ugas undercard. If you want to see it, but this is a very good fight, very worth watching this uh, because they went after it. Ortiz didn't quit, as he was expected to. He didn't quit, and they went after each other. And it was great to see both guys still apparently able to fight and able to gain. Uh, Ortiz hasn't been seen since. Now, of course, he's scheduled. he was scheduled to fight again. That didn't happen. So we don't know if he's coming back after the Guerrero fight. Point is, Guerrero's on a four-fight win streak. So Guerrero's still here, and as a result, Devin Alexander wants to crack at him because Devin Alexander thinks he can still do it. I suspect that if that fight does happen, Guerrero beats Alexander with ease, and then I think Alexander finally retires, which I think he should. But I think Guerrero goes on and continues doing his, his wins for as long as he lasts. Guerrero hasn't hit 40 yet, but he's getting close there, and then at some point he's going to tangle up against a title holder and get seriously hurt. Um, but he's one of those game fighters. He's been in the game a long time. And I'm, I'm celebrating seeing him fight. I know he's slightly older, but I'm celebrating seeing him fight. I think he's a great, great um, journeyman type fighter that can test some of these guys that are still in the business that perhaps need to hang it up and convince them that it's time, their time to get out of the game. So that's coming up. And the last thing I'll cover really quick. Well, not last thing, but a couple these are not really news. These are just FYIs. Uh, the... Uh, Golovkin Murata. I covered that at the beginning of the year back in January. Golovkin Murata. Uh, that's back on. That's going to be happening April 9th at the Satama Super Arena in Japan. Uh, this is highly regarded because of Golovkin more than anything. Because Golovkin's been kind of iffy. And we need to really have him tested. And then Murata's kind of untested. It's also unification. So this is a good fight to have. You're talking two solid guys. I would say to me, this is where I think Golovkin takes his next loss. I think Murata's going to get it. And I don't think it's going to be, I, I know they're going to be trying for a knockout, but I, I don't think it's going to go to a knockout. I think it's going to go to a decision. I think it's going to be, I think it's going to be Murata that catches Golovkin with something that causes Golovkin to go tentative. We saw the same thing against Derevchenko. This is based on what I saw both guys. Golovkin could go in there and just blow the dude out, but I just, I don't see it. I think Golovkin's been on the decline. I think Murata has been on the climb and I suspect that Murata is able to get it done. That's my prediction on that one. That's a really exciting fight. I can't wait to watch that fight, the so-called big drama show. I uh, want to definitely see that one. Ryan Garcia is pissed off, as he always is. That's why they call him Crying Garcia. But he's pissed off because the head of the head of the table in boxing, Canelo Alvarez, of course, has been criticizing him for crazy amounts of time. And Garcia kind of dusted it off at first and said, eh, it's just whatever. Now he's saying, you know what? I'm, I'm done with this. You got to stop hating on me. And the whole beef is just that it's ego. Garcia thinks he's bigger than he is, and he's going to get slapped down just like Tiafimo Lopez did. It'll happen. Canelo, speaking of that top guy, of course, everybody's calling out the cash cow, right? They all want to just make that money, and that's all it is because they want to cash out against the king. And when you talk about the Jamal Charlos of the world, uh, you talk about Bilal, uh, Benavides, there's so many names that were in play, and then Canelo ultimately chose Bilal. No matter who he chose, he was going to get criticism from NSB and other places, talking about he's ducking this guy over here. He's ducking Jamal Charlo because he picked Bilal. He's ducking Benavides because he picked Bilal. Or if he picked Jamal Charlo, oh, he's ducking Benavides, he's ducking Bilal. No matter which he picked, he was going to lose. And I believe he chose the biggest physical threat. Bivol is a very tall, very durable, very husky, very dominant type fighter. 
it, it, the size difference is staggering. Like we're not talking about a Kayla plant type difference or a yielder room difference or any of that stuff. Baval's a really solid, rugged dude. It's almost like David Hay and Valu of all over again. It's a very significant size difference that I think favors Baval. Here's the reason I think Canelo stops this dude. I've never rated Baval as a fighter. It's not that he's a bad fighter. I'm saying that when you compare him against Canelo and the smart fighting that Canelo does, I think Baval is going to make a mistake. Canelo is going to catch him with something. I think he's going to get wobbled because I suspect that his chin, Baval, has never been properly tested. I think he's going to get wobbled, and I think the ref's going to stop it. That's what I suspect. And then people like NSB, they're going to go out and say that, oh, Canelo waited too long or whatever excuse or there's going to be some excuse as to they're never going to give Canelo the credit that I think he deserves or those accuse him of PEDs regardless. I, that's my gut. I think Canelo easily beats Bilal. I don't see this significant threat. It's a threat because of physical size, but not because of skill. That's my gut telling me. You might remember some while ago, I said that Anthony Joshua, um, I was talking about one of the fights and I said, you know, Lennox Lewis had spoken out and he said, yeah, he's going to take sip aside money. And I said, okay, you probably shouldn't have said that on the air because everybody got really quiet. Joshua has finally come out and he's talked about this rumor about him taking step aside money. And people were calling him out saying, are you going to take a step aside? You're not going to fight Uzik. You're not going to actually get, you know, do the rematch because you got beat. And he said, I asked him for a big start to do when I knew that when they get, if they did get it, I would have considered it, but they didn't get it. So, okay. He asked for step aside money. That's the takeaway. He asked for it. He wanted step aside money. So he didn't really want to fight Uzik. He asked for step aside money. He said, I asked for enough money that they would not be able to give it to kind of force the issue. But he asked for step aside money. He didn't say, no, I want that. I don't want no money. I want that. Like, which is what Wilder did. So, yeah, I'm kind of sketchy on this one because it, this means that if he does get in there with Uzik, and by the way, Uzik's out there in Ukraine. He's out there doing the fighting uh, because of what's happening. Same as Lomachenko, which I'll talk about here in a second. But that's, to me, that's sketchy stuff. It means his mind's not in the right place. And if he fights Uzik again, which we don't know if it's going to happen, but if he fights Uzik again, he's going to get hurt, seriously hurt, because it seems like he just doesn't want it. It seems like he's not, his heart's not in the, in the game from my perspective. Tank Davis and Raleigh Romero. It's been pushed back a little bit. It's now going to happen in June, early June. It's again going to be Showtime pay-per-view. I know it's going to piss a lot of people off because nobody likes either guy. But it is going to be on Showtime pay-per-view in early June. That fight is highly, it's highly, it's going to sell. It's going to sell because both guys know how to sell a fight. They're both loud, brash talkers that are annoying, right? <laughs> and so they're going to sell this. And then you're going to have a lot of women dial in just because of these two guys. But I don't, you know, I've watched Raleigh. Most people say that Raleigh's going to get run over by Tank Davis. I'm not sure. Raleigh is not, I wouldn't say he's a stylistically brilliant fighter, but he's a dangerous puncher. Like he doesn't really need to throw a lot of punches. He just needs to catch you with that one. Tank seems to have declined in that regard. Like he can still catch you and take you out like we saw with Santa Cruz, but it's hard. It seems harder for him to. It seems harder for him to time that shot to have the same effect as we saw with Mario Barrios. So my gut tells me this is going to be more compelling of a fight than people are giving it credit. I don't see that Tank runs him over. I think what happens here is that Raleigh's going to catch Tank with some stuff. I think Tank's going to catch Raleigh with some stuff, and we're going to really see which one of these guys is able to take the smoke. My gut tells me Tank Davis is going to get the win. I don't think it's going to be by stoppage. If it's going to be something, it'll probably be some kind of nonsense ending, like a uh, something with the ref or something with a headbutt, right, or something that's sketchy where we don't really solve it. That's my guess because – Let's say that there's some shady business going on under the table. Could be that something gets done to ensure there's a rematch, as an example. It just feels like they're not going to trash Raleigh this early. And it also feels like they're not going to trash Davis's rep uh, this early. And they're going to want to do something fresh off the Isak Cruz fight for Tank to show that Tank is still dangerous. But I don't think that they're going to trash Raleigh. Of course, you know, Mayweather Promotions promotes both guys. So it's in their best interest that neither one loses. I, I'm being honest here. So I'm I'm thinking it's not going to be a clear-cut outcome. 
That's my gut. I'm thinking they're going to try to do this and build something from this that forces a rematch. That's what my that's my prediction. I don't think we're going to get an outcome. I don't think we're going to get something solved. I think we're going to see an exciting fight. I think we're going to see a drama filled fight. I think the build is going to be amazing. I think it's going to be a throwback in the build and the first few rounds of this fight is going to be exciting. You know, you're talking Mayorga type because that's what I see of Raleigh is basically a more refined version of Mayorga. So I think that that's the kind of thing you're going to see. And we're going to have to wait and see exactly how it turns out, uh, whether there's a sketchy ending or not. I just think that there's going to be. Chocolatito versus Martinez. Martinez, of course, he was a little bit overweight. Uh, and unfortunately, that's bad because when guys come in overweight, that usually means that they're about to take a loss. Uh, Martinez is going to have a fine levied against him. Uh, this is supposed to happen tomorrow. Yep, on the zone. So if you have the zone, you can dial in on that one. I do recommend it because I still think it's going to be an exciting fight. But this leans me more towards Chocolatito. Uh, Martinez is on short notice, so he didn't have the full length of camp that might have been better for him. But unfortunately, this weight problem is, I think, is going to work against him. At this weight class, I think it's going to work against him. I think Chocolatito now takes it. Um but I could be wrong. It could be that the weight helps him. But I would guess that the work he had to do in order to just get close to making weight, I I just think Chocolatito is going to take it. So that's my gut. Now, I say that Chocolatito doesn't look himself. Chocolatito doesn't look with the same confidence we're used to seeing from him. So I could be way off, and it could be that Martinez pulls it out or that it's a sketchy. I don't think it's a sketchy. I think Chocolatito takes him out. I would suspect probably a stoppage sometime before round uh, eight. I don't know exact rounds, but sometime before round eight, I would expect a stoppage of some kind. Could be a knockout, but I doubt it. But we'll have to wait and see um, how that one goes. I think it's an exciting fight for flyweight. Um, unfortunately, though, this changes the game because it also means that we haven't solved anything with these guys at flyweight because we, you know, getting rung with side was out. We didn't get to see that fight. Quadras got taken out, so we don't know what's happening there. And then you got Estrada, who's up in the air. And then now this business with the weight. So it doesn't give us any firm answers. With the lightning of the pandemic, hopefully we get to revisit some of these fights that we were cheated out of is our hope. But travel is going to be tricky for some of these guys to put it together here. I think they just happen to be in the United States uh, because of their promotions. And they just happen to get lucky, but you know, like Rung Vizai, I don't think he's in the United States, and he's the one I want to see back. I, I want to. Um, and then of course, Chocolatito was supposed to fight Estrada, and then Estrada had the COVID deal. So hopefully he's able to get back, but then he's not gonna be able to fight Chocolatito. So hopefully that opens up the rubber match with with Estrada and Rung Vizai. Like I I want to see more movement in this division, because again, let's be honest, they're the only ones giving us the fights that we really deserve. That's our weekend of boxing. The biggest one I could call out, of course, is Chocolatito versus Martinez. The other fight that's kind of in, that's on ESPN, but the other fight that's on the radar is Jose Ramirez and Jose Pedraza. That's junior welterweight. That's out in Fresno. If you're in the Fresno area, I do recommend that one. The reason I don't heavily cover that one is because I think both guys, personal opinion, I think both guys are going to come and they're going to bring it and they're going to fight hard, but I also think that both guys are on the decline and I don't know that there's going to be anything. I don't know that we'll answer any questions because of that fight. It's worth watching. If you're going to dial into ESPN, I just don't know that it's going to solve anything for us. It's not going to tell us anything about 140 that we didn't already know from both these guys. If that makes any sense. Um, that one's that one's schedule actually happened tonight on ESPN Ramirez versus Pedraza. So if you're interested in either guy, check that out tonight. Chocolatito Martinez is, of course, tomorrow. Next weekend isn't that exciting uh, necessarily. I will cover it, but it won't be that exciting. The real one, the big one, is going to be the week after that one, the 19th, the week of the 19th, where we see the return of Virgil Ortiz, and then Virgil Ortiz's name's been tossed around a lot, so the test he's fighting, I wouldn't say it's in his class, but if he gets exposed, it's going to harm his options for 147. Uh, and then also at super middleweight, we have Edgar Bumlanga versus Steve Rolls. If Bumlanga struggles with Steve Rolls like he struggled in his last fight, I hope NSB and other places stop overrating Bumlanga. That's my hope. I doubt it. That's my hope. 
uh, Avenesian, he's back in action. The week after that, we got Kiko Martinez, Josh Warrington. That one's going to be a really exciting fight. Uh, Brichelt, I don't really rate him, but I know a lot of he has a lot of fans. That one's happening. And then April's just stacked to the gills. You got Ryan Garcia's back. He's going to be tested at lightweight. Uh, Spence and Ugas is back. Uh, Casemiro is back. Paul Butler's back. They're supposed to be the Tyson Fury and Dillian White. I'm going to talk about that one in April because that one has a lot of drama. Oscar Valdez, Shakur, that one I want to talk about for sure. Katie Taylor and Amanda Serrano, I want to talk about that one. May is stacked already. Uh, Canelo, Bavall, Charlo, Castaño, Lara. It's on and on. Like from here on, assuming COVID doesn't get in our way, there's an exciting set of fights coming in the second quarter of 2022. That's all I got for you guys. I will check back in with you next weekend. Uh, it's doubtful. I probably will check Chocolatito Martinez. I'm not going to catch Ramirez Pedraza, but Chocolatito Martinez, I am going to work to catch that fight because I think we're going to see and answer some questions about both guys on that one. And then if I do catch it, I will do some coverage, and that would be Sunday. Check it out.